and the role of mini PCNL for the lower pole stone, with particular attention for stones less than one centimeter in the lower pole. So what is mini PCNL? Well, conventionally, mini PCNL is defined as using a scope less than 24 French. However, as you can see here, there's a heterogeneity of scope sizes from as small as the micro mini micro PCNL 4.8 French to as large as the MIP set of 17 French. So what is the difference between standard PCNL and mini PCNL? Well, standard PCNL is thought to confer a larger or higher stone free rate typically, whereas mini PCNL is thought to confer a lower uh, morbidity with respect to blood loss, complication, and length of stay. More recently, there's a large meta-analysis that suggests, suggests that actually the stone free rate between mini PCNL and standard PCNL is equivocal. However, the consistent disadvantage of the mini PCNL is the prolonged operative time thought to be due to the use of the smaller scope. Well, what's the difference between ureteroscopy and mini PCNL? Ureteroscopy is thought to confer a lower morbidity as well as it's an outpatient procedure typically, whereas mini PCNL on meta-analysis is thought to confer a higher stone-free rate. This table summarizes the difference that I've talked to you about between mini PCNL and standard PCNL as well as mini PCNL and ureteroscopy. And what you can see on the left-hand side is that the stone-free rate between mini and standard appears to be equivocal, but there's a lower morbidity associated with mini PCNL. When comparing to ureteroscopy, mini PCNL appears to have a higher stone free rate, but is associated with more morbidity. This flow sheet demonstrates our proposed algorithm for kidney stones that are less than two centimeters in size. And what you can see in line with the guidelines is that if the stone is in the mid or upper calyx, either shockwave or uteroscopy is a reasonable option. However, there are situations that the mini PCNL should be considered. For example, if the stone is slightly on the larger side, let's say arbitrarily 15 to 20 millimeters in size, or the st stone is particularly dense, like a hound seal is greater than 1200 units, then this might be a situation that the mini PCNL might confer a more efficient and better outcome. How about the lower pole? Well, the guidelines substratify less than one centimeter and greater than one centimeter in the lower pole. And for stones that are greater than one centimeter, typically ureteroscopy is recommended. However, there, there are situations, again, that you might want to uh, consider performing the mini PCNL. Similarly, if the stone is very hard or it's on the larger side, arbitrarily 15 to 20 millimeters in size, or if the stone's in an acute and unfavorable angle that predisposes to a difficult ureteroscopy, this might be a situation or these might be situations you might want to consider performing the mini PCNL. Well, what if the stone is less than one centimeter? The guidelines typically suggest that either shockwave or ureteroscopy are recommended for this situation. But how about mini PCNL? Is there a role for a mini PCNL for these small stones located in the lower pole? Again, you might want to consider if the stone is very hard or if the angle is very acute and unfavorable. This might be a situation to consider mini PCNL if the morbidity of the procedure uh, is minimal. This video demonstrates the vacuum effect, which is the technique used utilized for the Carl Stewart's uh, mini nephroscope. And what you see here, when done appropriately, there's no need for basketing utilizing the vacuum effect. The stones effectively come out and follow the scope in a vacuum-like effect. However, there are three conditions that are necessary for the vacuum effect. Number one, you wanna have high flow. Either raise the bag or use a pressure on the bag to create that high, high velocity irrigation. Number two, the sheet that's in my left hand there should be as horizontal as possible to the floor to take advantage of gravity. And number three, when pulling the scope out, at the very end, tip the scope 
um, to permit create this waterfall effect. That way the stone falls out of the sheath, not back down the sheath, but out and onto outside of the body. This cartoon that you're seeing here shows the vacuum effect. The purple represents the nephroscope in the sheath with high flow irrigation coming out and the gray represents the stone. And when you have high flow irrigation, there's a natural phenomenon to create this whirlpool or hurricane type phenomena where the outside has high velocity irrigation and then on the inside is this quiet area, much like the eye of a storm. And if the stone is entrapped in that area, it then uh, stays in that area as long as you have high flow irrigation. So if the scope is moving outside of the sheath, the stone will simply follow the scope, um, mimicking this vacuum effect. We recently reported our results in the Journal of Endurology, which is currently in press, of 60 uh, subjects that underwent the mini piece now over a year and a half. The average stone size was two centimeters with minimal blood loss. And using a very strict definition of no fragment seen whatsoever on a post-op CT performed at approximately six weeks, we reported a stone free rate of 43%. If we loosen the definition of the stone free rate to fragments seen on a post-op CT less than four millimeters, our stone free rate was 61%. You may say a stone free rate of 43% is not very impressive. However, there are contemporary series that utilize the same strict definition, no fragments seen whatsoever as seen here in this large cohort series. And they report similar outcomes at, of a stone free rate of 55% on this PCNL series. Another advantage of the mini PCNL is that we found the majority of our patients were actually able to go home that same day. Outpatient or ambulatory surgery was possible in 61% of our patients. Keep in mind, these patients didn't go home the next day like 23 hours later. They actually went home one to two hours after the procedure true outpatient procedure. Go, go, go. These are our complication um, rates of 15%. Note there were no Clavian four complications. The post-op emergency department revisit rate was 21%. And the readmission to the hospital post-operatively was 18%. So what about stones that are less than one centimeter in the lower pole? Again, there's not a lot of data out there. However, if we use our recent publication and substratify for stones less than one centimeter, we actually reported a stone free rate of 70% for these less sub one centimeter stones. Now, full disclosure, some of these, not all of these stones were in the lower pole, some were in the mid and some were in the upper pole. But I think this information is useful, useful in that it demonstrates when performing mini PCNL, we can achieve relatively acceptable stone free rates for sub one centimeter stones. However, we still need more data that we need uh, to understand what is a true stone free rate in a larger cohort series. Uh, but if nothing else, this is a good starting point for these sub one centimeter stones with mini PCNL. So what are my take home messages for you? Well, number one, I think I've demonstrated to you that mini PCNL should be considered for stones less than two centimeters in the kidney, in particular, if it's in the lower pole. Um, and I would say if the stone is on the larger side, larger size, let's say arbitrarily 15 to 20 millimeters, or if the stone is particularly dense, like greater than 1200 pounds for units, or it's in an unfavorable angle, these might be situations that a mini piece now uh, might be ideal. Now, how about for the stone that that's less than one centimeter, the small stone in the lower pole? Should we be performing mini piece now for these stones? Well, I think it's unclear at this point. We don't have a lot of data. However, there is some preliminary data out there that suggests that the stone for rates might be acceptable with, uh, with acceptable morbidity. So for yourself, I think you need to ask yourself, can I perform for the low, less than one centimeter stone lower pole, can I perform this a mini PCNL efficiently 
with minimal morbidity. And if I can perform this efficiently with minimal morbidity, there are situations I think that the mini PCNL might be justified. Again, in my mind, if the uh, stone is very dense or if the stone is in a uh, very acute angle that's not ideal for your ureteroscopy, this would be in my mind the, the role for a mini PCNL. A second take home point is that uh, the data clearly shows that the stone free roofs for mini PCNL are similar uh, to standard PCNL. And moreover, I think there's now data to suggest that uh, the mini PCNL uh, has a morbidity that is approaching the ureteroscopy. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so do you guys have any questions regarding um, that presentation? And um, I'm curious, um, how do you use mini PCNL? Is it for, what are the indications for mini PCNL at your hospital? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation, but uh, uh, not question, but I have some, uh, some comment. Um, in uh, our department, we used uh, some 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 years before we used uh, uh, only standard PCNL, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think three years, um, three years since three years we have a uh, uh, do done uh, mm -hmm. uh, mini PCNL uh, mm -hmm. for the most most patient. Uh, only the uh, patient with a stock and stone, we use a uh, standard PCNL because of, as you you, uh, you say, PC, mini PCNL is a, that's better for the patient, less uh, complication, the patient, uh, no pain, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we use uh, mainly uh, under uh, ultrasound guidance uh, sometimes uh, combined with the uh, X-ray. Uh, with the Sunda uh, PCNL, we use only uh, uh, X-ray uh, guidance, uh, but uh, now we use only the um, mini PCNL uh, with uh, ultrasound guidance. And uh, later, Dr. Min will uh, presentation presentate some uh, uh, a video from our department. Uh, and um, we use uh, uh, mainly laser, laser uh, homeom to uh, destroy the stone. I think mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And uh, uh, ESVN owns um, extra corporate uh, literacy. We have one, but uh, now we use only some uh, patient with a small uh, stone and maybe uh, residual after BCNL. And combine, uh, this is better for the patient. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, how about um, flexible ureteroscopy? Do you use um, flexible at all for the kidney? We have also flexible uh, URS and uh, uh, semi-rig also, but we use only for the small uh, stone in. Uh, mainly in the lower pond uh, and if another uh, if the stone in another uh, uh, position we can use uh, uh, ESVN uh, that's better yes 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 because the scope is expensive right yeah but problem in the uh, US, uh, US rest is that uh, <laughs> uh, is it the, the when when we you for? So okay. I'm sorry. So oh, no. you were saying um the uh, flexible scope, why? Uh... I, I, I prefer mini PCNL 
And uh, in future, we, we try to do a simple uh, mini PCNL because uh, when you use a uh, flexible uh, URSS, uh, the problem is uh, intrarenal pressure is high. That's not good, not good for patient. And in Vietnam, you see the infection, infection is a big problem. Uh, big problem. Uh, 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 not, not, not the same in your country, where the bacteria resistant many, many, many uh, antibiotics. That's the problem in our country. <clears throat> Why are the infections higher, do you think, with ureteroscopy? Oh, no. Ma many, many uh, cause the, uh, we, the patient can buy the antibiotic before they come to us. For example, uh, they treat with antibiotic 10, uh, 12 days, and then we come to us. Uh, second, the patient come to us very late when the patient, uh, the, when the, the patient uh, with stone and combine the uh, complication. That's not good for us. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, I, I can have some comment. Uh, in addition for the question, um, uh, due to this, I retain that in our country, the stone in infectious stone. So when we do a flexible copy, that I retain that the intrarenal pressure is very high, uh, more than the PCNL, and, and I retain we, the patient have a high rate of the sepsis after a surgery than the, the PCNL in the than flexible. What type of pressure do you use? Do you use a pressure bag or do you use a, a pump, hand pump? Uh, we, we do a pump. We do a pump. Uh, but, um, yeah. Yeah, because the hand pump can really create high pressures, you know, compared to the irrigation bag. Um, what's interesting that now there are new scopes coming that will measure the pressure during flexible ureteroscopy, probably later this year or next year, we will start to see them. Okay. I wonder if you had those scopes, if it would change your practice. Yeah, we, we have also uh, now the flexible uh, uh, ureteroscope from a stalls, flexic, a flexist. I think good, but uh, not so so very good because um, they not so good for for the water uh, come out. Um, what do you mean? Why is it not good? Uh, I I think I think uh, now then uh, in the market have uh, the sheet with uh, two way. One way for the uh, water in and one way the water out is better. Yes. Do you like to use the access sheet? Yeah, we use. Yeah. I feel like the access sheet prevents infections. It helps prevent. Yeah. <clears throat> So this is a talk that, up, that uh, provides kind of an update on some of the topics in um, PCNL surgery. And um, Dr. Sir, I think you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so this new hospital we have here, it focus, It was built several years ago. It focuses on uh, high-risk neonatal care, high-risk OB, and uh, advanced surgery. The rooms are nicer than my house. <laughs> Each of the rooms has a big screen TV, and they have an iPad. It's quite fancy.
And this is next to the hospital. They built a new clinic also where our urology department is located. And downstairs, we have um, eight OR beds also for outpatient surgery. So these are some of the disclosures I have. Um, I'm hoping in the PCNL in 2030 that most PCNL will be done this way, tubeless, outpatient, and all ultrasound like you are doing. So tubeless, it's interesting because historically the nephrostomy tubes that many people are using, um, they have only, uh, they actually originally, we did not use nephrostomy tubes when we did PCNLs. In fact, in 1984, uh, Dr. Wickham did, he reported 250 cases of PCNLs and none of them had nephrostomy tubes. Um, 150 were two stage, 100 were single stage, but he didn't, did not use nephrostomy tubes back then. It's only in 1986, two years later, that Ralph Clayman proposed that we should always use nephrostomy tubes. But it's interesting, the basis of this was just two patients. So two patients had, um, had complications. One of them had a perirenal hematoma with need for blood, and the other one developed a fistula and needed a chest tube. And because of these two cases, I spoke to Dr. Clayman one time and he says, yes, I, I want this surgery to, for anyone to do. And because we had two bad complications, my recommendation is that everyone should do um, put a nephrostomy tube. But I thought to myself, does that make sense? So everyone throughout the world puts nephrostomy tubes because of these two cases. I think that's interesting. In 1997, Gary Bellman from Los Angeles, Kaiser, he challenged this, this idea. He says, wait a second. We didn't used to put nephrostomy tubes before. Why are we doing it now? So he did a randomized controlled trial of 50 tubeless patients. Now, when he says tubeless, he actually put a stent in them versus nephrostomy tube. And he showed a benefit to those who did not have a nephrostomy tube. Shorter hospital stay, less analgesic, length of oral anesthetic was less, return to activity is quicker, and there was a cost savings to the cases that, that did not have a nephrostomy tube. So why do we put a nephrostomy tube? Is it to stop the bleeding? Is it to allow the kidney to heal better? Is it to drain, drain urine? Or maybe if you're gonna go back and need a second look. And because of these reasons, tubeless PCNL still is controversial for some reason. People say, these are the reasons why we need to always put a nephrostomy tube. But I would like to challenge that concept. There are multiple benefits of not using a nephrostomy tube. Less pain, shorter hospitalization, the patient heals quicker, there's less urine uh, um, on the patient's back, and there's a lower cost with no difference in the complications. And this is a meta-analysis from 2011 showed that comparing tubeless to nephrostomy tube, across the board, multiple studies that there's less pain overall when you use a tubeless type surgery versus a, a standard nephrostomy tube. Urine extravasation. This is very worrisome to the patient. You know, what I mean by this is that, you know, you, you do a PCNL and a nephrostomy tube and there's urine on the back, right? And then the nurse calls the resident. There's urine coming on the, the dressing is soaked. You and I say, oh, no big deal. It's just urine, no big deal. But when was the last time you or I had urine coming out of your back? That's weird, that's scary. This is really worrisome to the patients to see urine coming out of their back, right? And so, when this is a uh, prospective randomized trial of, uh, I think it's Mahesh Desai, and he compared nephrostomy tube, um, large bore, small bore, and no nephrostomy tube, just a stent. And look how long it took for these two groups for their urine to go away. This one only had about five hours of urine coming out of the back. These had much more urine coming out of the back. Same thing again here in this randomized control trial. 
large bore nephrostomy tube, substantial leak in seven out of 100 patients. Patients with no nephrostomy tube, tubeless, no leaks. So again, we're showing here that when you put a nephrostomy tube, patients will have urine coming out of their back. Again, you and I may say, no big deal, but I then ask you, when was the last time that you, any of you in the audience, had urine coming out of your back? And would that bother you? Of course it would, it's very worrisome, right? So the other concern that people say, well, I put a nephrostomy tube because I don't want more bleeding. But does that really stop the bleeding? In, in fact, in this meta-analysis, we show that the black shows multiple studies. There's no difference if you do tubeless or nephrostomy tube. There's no difference in the bleeding. So using a nephrostomy tube does not decrease the bleeding. How about post-operative pain? Again, same thing. Multiple studies show in this meta-analysis that it, even when you do not put a nephrostomy tube, there's less pain for the tubeless nephrost uh, PCNL. So your patients are happier. So if you don't do P tubeless PCNL, how would you start? My recommendation would be first oh, start with the cases you have small stones. Pick a case that the operative time is very short. Uh, pick a case where you know there are no residual stones. Maybe there's very little blood loss and there's no perforation. Basically a very nice case. This is the ideal case to start doing a tubeless PCNL. This is something that uh, we do, particularly for males, is that we leave the string coming out of the side. That way, when the patient comes back to have their stent removed, they don't need to have a cystoscopy. The string is left out of the side. And this is a mini PCNL you can see here. And then we just pull the string several days later um, from the back. Okay. Length of hospital stay is shorter with a, a tubeless as well, right? Patient doesn't have a bag coming to the back, they can go home sooner. So the next thing I wanna talk about is outpatient PCNL. Patients going home the same day after surgery. This is kind of a newer concept and still has not been uh, adopted widely throughout the United States and definitely not throughout most other countries for other reasons, but I wanna talk about it. I started doing this back in 2015. This was my fellow at the time. And he wanted to start doing outpatient PCNL because he had read about it. And he actually sent the patient home the same day. And we brought home the patient the next day. And I was very scared, but the patient was fine. We checked the blood count, patient was normal, patient was fine. And from that point forward, we started doing outpatient PCNLs. In fact, this is a series we wrote up in 2018 of 60 outpatient PCNLs. Um, of the 60 that we were gonna send home, we only sent home 72% of them. We didn't send all of them home. Um, of those 72 that were sent home, 10% came back and 20% had a complication, mostly were clavian one and two. So who would you do an outpatient PCNL on? Well, or when would you do it? Well, obviously like where you're operating, where you do a high volume of surgery, I think that makes sense. In a case with minimal blood loss, definitely wanna put a double J stent in and the patient looks good in the recovery. And what I mean by looks good is the patient's not in a lot of pain and you didn't feel like you lost a lot of blood. You can kind of tell, you look at the patient, they have normal heart rate, normal blood pressure, they're fine. And obviously also they don't live far away. If the patient lives far away, then I don't send them home um, that same day. What I will do sometimes, actually I'll send them to a hotel outside of the hospital, uh, next door to the hospital. But if they live far away, I understand that could be a problem. This is something that uh, we do, we put into the tract. It's a gel foam that we roll up really tight. We put it into the nephrospy tube tract and then we inject some thrombin. And we feel like this helps with the uh, hemostasis. So here you can see that the gel foam we put into the tract and then we push it into the tract and then we close up the skin. This was written up by my fellow uh, several years ago with someone else in the Journal of Endourology. 
this is what it looks like in a CT. It's important to know because sometimes the radiologist will call you afterwards saying, hey, what is this thing coming out of the kidney? And you can just reassure them, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a uh, gel foam. So how about ultrasound and gouted axis? This is something that you guys are obviously doing. Um, and it's something that I only recently started maybe, well, not recently, so recently, maybe five years ago. Um, this is how I position my patients for the supine PCNL. I also do prone PCNL with the ultrasound, but I like, I prefer the supine position. This is a picture that I borrowed from Dr. Duisti from Italy, and it shows the positioning. One leg is straight, the other one is in lithotomy. And what this permits me is access to the flank as well as to the perineum. So I can do an endoscopic guided uh, PCNL. Uh, this is another patient. You can see the towels here. It's a towel here, a towel here, a towel here. One leg is straight. The other one is bent. And this permits me access here. And I can put a flexible ureteroscope up here. I also can put an access sheath up here so I can decrease the pressure inside the kidney. Here you can see access from the perineum. This is my setup for the room. I have the, the resident is here. I am here. And I am looking at this monitor and he or she is looking at this monitor. And my ultrasound is over here. And I do use a C-arm because um, it's not pure ultrasound. I use ultrasound with C-arm. Um, I tell people whenever I'm gonna do a PCNL in the clinic, I always do an ultrasound to see, can I see the kidney in the supine position? Um, because if I can't see it in the clinic, in the supine, then I will not do a supine PCNL. I will do a prone PCNL. So I always make sure that I can see the, the kidney in supine in the clinic. And then here's, um, remember, I always tell people, if you are doing prone ultrasound, make sure to remember that the kidney Oh, sir, sorry. The kidney uh, is at an angle here. Okay, so you have to turn the probe slightly to align with the kidney. See, I turn the probe. That way you can see the kidney in its full uh, sagittal view. So why are we still performing floral guided access in the United States and many countries? Well, number one, we can't see the kidney. What I mean by that is if we understand how to use the ultrasound better, it improves our visualization. And I always tell my residents, there are, there are several settings you should understand on the ultrasound machine. The frequency, the depth, the focus, and the gain, as well as the time gain compensation, TGC. Every machine is different. This is the uh, BK ultrasound. But they all have these buttons somewhere, but there's just different locations on different machines. So what is the frequency? The frequency is the cycles per second that the, trend, that the probe is emitting, okay? You want to use not a high frequency probe, but you want a low frequency probe. If you use a high frequency probe, you will see only superficial structures. We typically reserve a high frequency probe for um, structures like the testicles or the penis, six to 12 megahertz. If you're looking at the kidney, you always wanna use a low frequency probe. You get deeper penetration of solid organs. So three to six megahertz. Depth. Depth is uh, shown here. There's too large. This is too small for the testicle, right? What you wanna do is, is change the depth. By changing the depth, you can change the size of your organ on the screen. That's too small. And that looks just right. So again, if the kidney looks too small or too big, change the depth and you will get the right size. The next thing is focus. These two arrows here on many machines typically demonstrate the focal zones. You want your organ of interest to be in between these focal zones. Sometimes you'll only have like one arrow. Let's say you just had this one arrow then what you should do is make sure the kidney is below this line here, below the focal zone. Otherwise you will not see the kidney very well. Gain or 
as well as time gain compensation. So gain, here's a probe. There are many transponders in here that emit ultrasound energy. They hit a structure and they bounce back, right? The gain is the sensitivity of the transponders. There's usually about six or seven transponders located here. And the gain changes the sensitivity of the transponders. So here is an example of too much gain. Here is an example of not enough gain. And by altering the gain, you can um, make the picture more ideal. See here, not enough gain. Now there's too much gain. So then we turn down the gain to make it just right. What is the right amount of gain? The right amount of gain is what looks good to you. How about TGC? TGC refers to all those levers. Um, it refers to each, each, hold on. Each one of these numbers here is a lever, okay? And it controls the brightness or the gain for each level. And here you can see the line shows it here and here the, the levers are a little off and that corresponds to here. You see how it's too bright here and too bright here. So if we change the levers to be more in line, the picture becomes more normal. Here's an example. You can see that the bladder and the prostate are very bright kind of down here. So now I'm gonna change the, uh, I'm gonna change the TGC on this here. You'll see it changing here. I'm changing the levers and that makes the picture more ideal. What is the right uh, position for the levers? It's whatever looks good to you. I always make sure that these TGC is sitting right in the middle in the very beginning of the case. Otherwise it, get, it can be very confusing, but there's no right place or wrong place. It's as long as the picture looks perfect to you. And the, the other reason that a lot of people in the United States don't do ultrasounds is because they can't see the needle. Here's a case we were doing where um, the needle's going in, but I never saw the needle go into the kidney, and yet there was urine there. Here comes the needle. I can never see it. I actually was teaching someone, and they did it, and they got the, they got the needle into the kidney, but I never saw it. <laughs> so, and the reason for that is the needle is difficult to see. Here's an example of the needle coming down. It's a little more obvious. Here you'll see the needle come in. Right there, the needle. Yeah. needle just came in. So, but admittedly, it's difficult to see the needle. Here's a, here's a video again. You'll see the needle coming in. Right there. That's when the needle went in. So, again, you have to train your eye to see it. But this is the reason why a lot of urologists in the United States don't like ultrasound. They feel it's difficult to see it. And so, this is why I like to put a scope from below. I can actually move the scope and see the scope on ultrasound. And then I can pick the ideal calyx. Or if I'm having difficulty seeing, here you can see the scope moving right there. And I pick the calyx. So that's the mid cement. Uh, it can also create hydronephrosis uh, for you. Saw, huh? That's another reason to put the scope up from below. So should you use a needle guide or should you freehand it? I like to use a needle guide because I'm teaching the residents all the time. I usually have a junior resident with me. I don't have a senior resident. So I think the needle guide is helpful. It makes it easier. However, admittedly, there are some disadvantages. It may limit your angle of insertion. Some people say it's a crutch. Um, here's just an example of uh, using the Hitachi Loka. This is a case where I actually injected methylene blue from below so that I could help see when I was in. It was kind of nice actually, because once you see urine, then it turns blue. I always preload the needle into the ultrasound. Are we recording this? Yeah, he's recording yeah, that. This separately. patient's in supine position. Right there. Here you can see the gain is really bad, right? Too low. So I will make it brighter. Turn up the gain. And now it's easier to see. 
and I use the needle guide to put the uh, to put the needle into the calyx of interest. Right there. This Navigide needle is very echogenic. I like this needle actually. Let's put the needle in here. And I kind of move a very staccato, very herky jerk. That way I can see the needle coming in. See my hand kind of. On off x ray. And I use it with x ray to make sure that I'm in. On off x-ray. You can okay. see the blue urine there. It was kind of quick, but there was blue urine coming out because I put methylene blue from below. The BK5000 is the current ultrasound that I use. I like this machine a lot. The image is really good. Uh, it has a disposable guide and there are three places you can put the needle in for this. Here you can see the needle coming in. The picture is really good on this one. And you can see the needle coming in and boom, we're in. Okay. So again, freehand, um, people who do a lot of ultrasound recommend to do the freehand. You can get any angle you want. They say that needle, uh, needle holders are a crutch. They limit your angle of insertion. They can be clumsy. Uh, the disadvantage is you need to do this a lot and feel very comfortable with the ultrasound and it requires a stable hand. I definitely think it's doable. You just have to commit yourself to doing it if that's what you want to do. I don't use it because I'm teaching residents and I feel like it's kind of difficult, especially with the junior residents. And I like my residents to do the operation. So lastly, um, if you're doing ultrasound, um, then we need you to be a teacher. <laughs> we need more teachers. Um, here's my learning curve in the beginning when I was using ultrasound. The first one I got in, and then I, and then I, oops, then I failed, and I failed again, and then I got in, I got in, I got in, I got in, I failed, I got in. I occasionally I would fail using ultrasound, but the point being is I never gave up, and so that's important is that. Um, to keep doing it and never give up. This was a course we did at the Western section with Dr. Chi from UCSF. And it was, a, it was the first ultrasound guided course uh, for the Western section at the AUA that we ran. And since then, we have, I've traveled all over the United States trying to teach other people and trying to teach academic people that way they can teach like you guys are doing. So what are my uh, take home points for learning ultrasound? Number one, practice, practice, practice. I practice on everyone, on the residents, on my colleagues. If I was in Vietnam, maybe I'd practice on you. Um, I think the image, when, when you hook it up to the uh, OR monitor, sometimes looks better than on the machine itself. Um, the other thing that I do is um, when I'm trying to learn, uh, if I already have an ultrasound done by the radiologist, I still would do the ultrasound on the patient. And I'll say, listen, I just want to take a look at your kidney. And they usually are very happy in the clinic. And I'm looking for the things that I already see on the radiology ultrasound because the radiologist has already done it for you. The second thing that really helped me a lot is I spent some time with an ultrasound technician one day and I learned so much from that person. Uh, you can also have them come into the OR possibly, but by spending just uh, one morning with the ultrasound technician, I learned so much about ultrasound. And again, lastly, like everything you do, practice, practice, practice. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your presentation. That's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, later, uh, Dr. Minh will uh, say something, but um, I, I uh, say some uh, piece now in, 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 in my, department. Uh, the position in uh, our department, we, before we use only a uh, bronze, uh, bronze position mm. with the uh, CR, CRM uh, guidance, but uh, and later we use a 
uh, supply uh, supply position, but supply position is a little bit difficult because we have um, difficult for 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 uh, getting the access to in uh, into the renal uh, into the kidney, and uh, normally there are, there, is, there are some uh, air bone of the tip of the uh, uh, nephroscope, something that's not good for, for us because the nephroscope only uh, on way uh, in the higher than uh, the tip is higher. Uh, now we use only the parallel work position uh, like the for for open surgery. Uh, that's better for for the anesthesis. Uh, we can choose um, uh, the uh, position for uh, as, uh, to, to get a set into uh, uh, kidney uh, and we can uh, easier to uh, um, uh, take the position for the uh, for the patient because some patient is very very big like in in America 100 kilogram we can uh, it's difficult for for work. Uh, for us and uh, ultrasound as um, in uh, beginning is very difficult. We have an, uh, only uh, freehand ultrasound guidance. Difficult. We need time and more practice. Practice. Uh, I don't know how how long, but um, many months. And our, after that, we can uh, not so good, but as accepted acceptable uh, for this uh, procedure but i think in the future ultrasound is better than uh, better than cr but i think it's my, easy. i think it's uh, do, we feel like it's easier the ultrasound than the floral for the students for, for ultrasound now it's yeah. easier but the beginning is not so so busy uh, not, not so easy <clears throat> yes, exactly. I agree. You, I, I you agree. Combine, yeah, you combine uh, ultrasound and CM is the best. Is the best. Yes. But uh, in Vietnam, in the South Vietnam, in the South Vietnam, uh, they use uh, only the most uh, doctor use only uh, uh, ultrasound, uh, uh, CM. But in North Vietnam, use only. Uh, ultrasound in central yeah. Vietnam in our opinion, maybe combined. Mm. That's different. Yeah. And uh, why did you start doing ultrasound? Just curious. How did you decide to do ultrasound? Ultrasound? Yeah. Why? Why did you start to? Why did you want to learn it many years ago? Um, because um, I think ultrasound we can get the. Uh, uh, assess better than uh, CM. With CM, we can we can see the renal, but maybe maybe another uh, organs, for example, intestinal uh, colon, maybe we met them match. This other side, we we can we can uh, get into uh, renal is better. I agree. You can see everything. <coughs> right? Yes, yeah. I agree with you. Mm. And uh, and uh, then I. Uh, I would like to, uh, to Min will uh, present something about PCNL in uh, our department. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, so I uh, use, uh, I would like to introduce about uh, the PCNL, mini PCNL in our department. Uh, we uh, recently uh, doing it for right, maybe three years ago. Um, and uh, in the honored case, we try to do the poor ultrasound is without the, 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 the CM. But uh, sometimes uh, you, in a difficult case, we can combine the, the ultrasound and CM. Um, uh, uh, could you uh, see the screen well? Yes, I can see the screen very well. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, uh, so in our hobby tour, we do mini PC now and then, um, and that's 18 French, 18 French. Uh, we think that flank, uh, and the, the patient position is flank position and because uh, we think it's, uh, it's better for the optimal cardiovascular and airway control and it's better for the anesthesia and the short operation time due to lack of the need for repositioning. Uh, in addition, uh, the UF ultrasound can uh, avoid radiation exposed and provide a uh, revival for the lo localization of renal stone, especially, uh, especially in the known or space stone and are not visible via full autoscopy. Uh, and I think it's um, in the next we think in the color ultrasound Doppler can be used and tuned for localization of intrarenal artery. So uh, sometimes we can avoid the pitch artery and uh, uh, lead complication in uh, bleed, um, bleeding. Uh, but our study to assess safety uh, effectively of poor ultrasound why uh, this mini PC now. Uh, we do in uh, call as a uh, 16K. Uh, and the method we use the A19 gore needle to introduce the kidney is same with the freehand technique. Uh, here we the, the, the short video clip. Um, we have a, the male patient of uh, 53 years old, and we can see a stone here, a quite bit, more than two centimeter. And we decide to uh, perform the mini DC now. And you can see we use a uh, US scope for the uh, stone fragment, and you can see the needle here and the dilation. Is this part done with X-ray or ultrasound? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Ah. Uh, we uh, later on. Stone fragment. Is this the Carl Stortz scope? Which scope? Uh, you're at the scope. Uh, no. Which, which company? Uh, Scanstock. Which which company? Scanstock. Yes, and, yes, yes. And you yes, uh, we do the same thing with you for vacuum effect to let um, uh, to get the stone fragment. Yes, is this clear Petra the sheath you use? Yeah, I know. The the black sheath. What sheath is that? Yep. This is eighteen eighteen uh, French 18. sheath. Uh, but what company makes a sheath? Uh, made from China. Uh, is it well lead? Uh, clear Petra? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I don't remember yet the company name, but uh, it's yeah. from China. It's, uh, I think it's uh, a well lead from uh, Clear Petra from China. Mm, okay. Yes. Yeah. And the third seminary, we are definitely our legend's 40 meter stone fragment. Uh -huh. uh, and we, uh, the ascent was successful in 19 of 19K and the uh, operating time around 19 minutes. And I think that um, the successful rate is maybe around 18%. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, we, uh, I th we think that is uh, safe and effective. We, if, if we can try to uh, do a, a mini bit scenario with poor ultrasound, uh, but we have to, I think we have to uh, evaluate the kidney before the surgery and uh, decide and strong and to decide that we can, sometimes we need to uh, have a CRM uh, uh, for the, the operation, but we on the way do the ultrasound first. In a difficult, we combine with the CRM. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there courses for learning ultrasound in Vietnam? Yeah, um, uh, is, uh, for beginning, we have not courses, but the college from uh, from department of, uh, of uh, uh, imaging and analysis helped us 
in uh, for on uh, doctor in uh, my department. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's it's difficult to teach, like you said, or difficult to learn, maybe. Um, but if you have all your students learning, then it will be easier each year. More and more people will learn ultrasound, right? Did you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm curious, when you first did the first time you did ultrasound, did you do by yourself or did you have a visitor? Yeah. Um, in the first time, we have a support from the radiology doctor. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. So you, you didn't have a visitor from China or somewhere else? No visiting professor? No. Wow. That's really good. <laughs> Well, that's what I did too. I didn't have anyone to teach me. I had to teach myself. It was difficult. But after I did it the first time, I was like, oh, it's not so difficult. Yeah. We, 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 we take uh, some, some months with the help uh, from uh, college, from uh, uh, radiology. And then after that, we can make uh, ourselves. Yeah. I got help from the radiology uh, technician too, and it was very helpful. I learned a lot from them. Yes, I agree. So, well, that's really impressive. That's great you were doing that. Um, maybe one day we could work together or something. Um, and, you know, we maybe, um, maybe we could show you some of our, our flexible ureteroscopy because flexible ureteroscopy, I wonder if PCNL will die one day and maybe flexible ureteroscopy will take over. Or maybe flexible ureteroscopy will die and PCNL will take over. I don't know. <laughs> we, we can choose, we depending are, on the patient, depending we, on the doctor, depending hmm. on the department, yeah. I made a device that is an, a, a vacuum cleaner for ureteroscopy. Hmm. So you break up the stone with ureteroscopy and then you suck it all out through the uh, access sheath. Yeah, yeah. And if that works, yes. I think it will kill PCNL. Uh, yeah, no. very well. Some super mini PCNL may be better. Hope not. <laughs> yeah, this 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 machine it device it works very effective with big stones. So we'll see. Maybe maybe you'll see it next year. <laughs> We used it in India uh, two years ago, and it was very effective. Okay, I go. Okay. Well, listen, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, do you have any other questions? Uh, for for the uh, for our patient uh, when uh, you uh, he they leave the hospital uh, they uh, take how many they they, they take uh, ban antibiotic or not um <clears throat> just um less than 24 hours um, only, um, only at time of surgery and then no more, less than 24 hours, unless the patient is very sick. If it's a sick patient, then yes, sometimes I will extend it for several days, but usually only less than 24 hours. Cause usually I give it at, at, at surgery and they go home. So there's no more antibiotics. That means you use only one dose antibiotic before operation. Yeah, but I just published a paper in the Journal of Urology. I don't know if you saw it in May. We just published this paper. Um, I can show you. Um, it is. Um, it shows that we use before surgery. We will do several days of antibiotics. Um, but after surgery, we don't do any antibiotics. 
Um, how about you guys? What is your what is your practice? Uh, we we um, we use the antibiotic maybe more than you in the U.S. because uh, uh, you know it's in Vietnam that the, we have a um, high prevalence but the UTI and more strongly the infectious. So we uh, usually we use antibiotics for the maybe five or seven days after uh, surgery. Hmm. I see. Um, yeah, so um, in the Journal of Urology, we just published our uh, article on, um, uh, on PCNL and antibiotics. Hold on one second, I will show you something. And it describes our use of antibiotics before um, surgery. Do you have some uh, patient with the stone, but in the stone have uh, some bacteria inside the stone? And after you destroy stone, maybe bacteria can spread. <clears throat> So here's my Twitter account. Um, this is a paper we just published. Um, the Journal of Urology is the EDGE Consortium. It shows that for patients who are high risk, it is better to give seven days of antibiotics than two days before surgery. So if you want to read this article, it just came out. Um, But after surgery, we don't give antibiotics usually, unless it's a high risk patient. So, anyway. So, what 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 is reason you only give the antibiotics before operation, but not after operation? Yeah, not after the operation. In this so study, in this study, we did not give antibiotics after the operation, only before. And very little. The risk of sepsis and septic shock was very minimal. Uh, I think only one patient had septic shock of 123 patients. You can read the article. It's in the Journal of Urology. It just came out this month. So this is an EDGE study with multiple institutions. Um, we had Dr. Cranbeck, Dr. Beaches, Dr. Manga, Dr. Miller, Dr. Benchu, Dr. Knudsen. We had uh, many, uh, many urologists on this study. So, well, maybe we can talk about infections or something next time. Maybe I can come visit you one day. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, it was nice to meet you guys. I appreciate the time. Um, I'm, uh, thank you for letting me talk to your, uh, to your hospital and your trainees. Uh, it was very nice to meet you. Oh, thank you so much for uh, your presentation, and uh, thank you also. Uh, have you met? Uh, help us to uh, have a chance to discuss something, and uh, hope that in future we uh, we can good connection. Uh, we can good connect, and uh, uh, after uh, when the COVID uh, is a stop, yeah, you can come here and uh, please uh, we, we can come to you. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to visit and I'd love to have you come visit us. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys so much. So much. Um, this lecture we will have on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to go back and rewatch it, um, it will be available on the YouTube channel as well as on our website. So thank you for you know, taking the time um, to be with us today and to thank you to Dr. Sir for a wonderful lecture. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.